In the beginning, God, the love of our souls, the source of goodness, truth, and justice, a perfect kingdom of love and light. Until war broke out in heaven through one fallen angel who broke God's perfect law, Lucifer coveted God's throne and authority and deceived one third of the angels to rebel against the Holy One. Since that time, Earth is a war zone where the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit battle it out in a life or death conflict. Are you just a spectator or have you taken sides? Are you living the victorious life God intended for you to have? Let Marla Alona guide you through the truth of God's word that you may choose right, that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and that God's truth may bring you eternal life. Welcome to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for coming back for part two of Truth Restored, the powerful story of how all the truths that were cast to the ground by the Antichrist power have been restored and have been uh, upheld by the Protestant Reformation. And 2017 was the celebration of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And now we're going to get deeper into the prophecy of how the truth would be restored. So in part one, we understood what were the truths that were cast to the ground. We understood um, a little bit about the history of the church and how some of these events unfolded over time. And now in part two, we're going to keep going deeper into scripture and into the sanctuary as our frame of reference. And we're going to talk now about the prophecies about the restoration of truth and we're going to map these truths onto that framework or that skeleton, which is the sanctuary, so that we can understand when the Bible says that the Antichrist power casts truth to the ground, casts the sanctuary to the ground, we're going to understand exactly what that means because we're going to go and pin every lie to an article of furniture in the sanctuary or a section of the sanctuary and then we're going to do the same thing with the truth. We're going to take every major truth that was restored and we're going to map that back to a corresponding section or article of furniture in the sanctuary. This is a beautiful study. I'm so glad that you're back with us for part two. Let's get started. The Prophecy of the Restoration of Truth Okay, now we're coming to the exciting conclusion in this whole drama of the defilement of the sanctuary by the little horn or the beast or the Antichrist power. It all means the same. It's all the same power. We're going to find out when and how in God's plan of redemption, the sanctuary would be cleansed and restored. This was actually prophesied in the book of Daniel. This is so beautiful and so powerful. Let's listen closely to as this story, actually, this story is still in the making, brothers and sisters. Okay, there's a prophecy in the book of Daniel that tells us when the sanctuary would be cleansed and restored. That prophecy is the famous prophecy called the 2300-day prophecy. It's found in Daniel 8, verses 12 to 14. We have dealt with this prophecy in the past, but today we're going to look at it from a slightly different angle. It's the continuation of the passage that we read in part one, where it was telling us, where the book of Daniel was telling us that the Antichrist power took away the continual sacrifice, meaning Jesus' perfect sacrifice was taken away, was removed by the Antichrist power. Well, these are the verses right after that verse, that passage, if you will. So now let's read Daniel 8, verses 13 and 14 now. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily or the perpetual sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? The RSV says to be trampled underfoot. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is so important. Let me read that again. 
And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Remember, we're talking about prophetic time. We're dealing with prophetic time. So if it says two thousand and three hundred days, what does that mean? It means two thousand and three hundred years. Twenty three hundred years. That's a long time. Okay. Now, it's very interesting that, the again, the RSV, which is the Revised Standard Version, uses the language, the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So instead of saying, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, it says, the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful place. That's a very important nuance there, because um, what we're going to be focusing on now is not the cleansing of the sanctuary. We've already dealt with that when we studied the Day of Atonement, remember? The Day of Atonement is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now we're going to deal with the other side of the coin, which is the restoration of the sanctuary, the restoration of its holiness, its authority, and its truth. So in part one, we learned that the papacy would be allowed to trample the host underfoot meaning that it would be allowed to persecute the saints of the Most High for a long period, right? We saw that 1260 years. The Pope's power was taken away in 1798 by the sword. What does that mean? The sword means the military power. Napoleon's army arrested and imprisoned the Pope. He was taken captive. And the Bible, it's interesting, in Revelation 13.10 the Bible had prophesied that, already John the Revelator had prophesied that, when the Bible says of the Antichrist, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Revelation 13 verse 10. So God used the French sword, the French army, the military, to render justice unto the papacy. So its power was taken away, its power was taken away by the sword, and it was led into captivity. In fact, the Pope lived almost as a prisoner inside Vatican City for a hundred and forty years. It was Mussolini that restored the Pope's sovereignty over the Holy See. So the Holy See is another name for Vatican State. So when Mussolini was rising up to power, he established a pact with the papacy. Now, we're going to read now a quote from the New York Times published on February 12, 1929. It reads, Rome, the Pope is again an independent sovereign ruler as he was throughout the Middle Ages. Though his temporal realm established today is the most microscopic independent state in the world and probably the smallest in all history. So, on that day in 1929, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, who subsequently became Hitler's closest ally, signed the Lateran Concordat or the Lateran Pact with the papacy. And the papacy, uh, well, the Pope didn't come in person. He was represented by Cardinal Gaspari. There's actually a photo in the New York Times of that day in 1929 of Cardinal Gaspari. And based on this agreement, this pact that he established with the papacy, Mussolini would recognize the papacy's sovereignty over the Holy See. So he would, he would recognize the Pope's authority as a head of state, is what this is telling us, in exchange for the Pope's support for his dictatorship. The Lateran Concordat in 1929 was the first step in the healing of the deadly wound described in Revelation 13. We said earlier that the deadly wound was received in 1798, right? Napoleon. 1260 years have gone by, 1260 years as prophesied of papal power and uh, a reign of terror, actually, if the truth be said, it was a reign of terror for 1260 years. And then the sword cuts off the head of the papacy, uh, symbolically speaking, and the papacy is wounded. The healing of the wound started 
again in 1929 through this agreement between Mussolini and the Pope and that healing continues today and I believe that under Pope Francis I believe that that healing will be complete. Let's go back now to the cleansing and the restoration of the sanctuary. So the saint that Daniel overheard in his dream or his vision said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed or restored. That was Daniel 8.14. So the key question at this point is, when did the 2,300 years start and end, right? That's the only way, in the same way that we said the 1260 years started in the year 538 and then extended until the year 1798. We also need to know, well, when does the 2300 year period start, right? When does the counter start? And when does it end? Because this is a very long period of time. So let me give you the answer. The starting point for the 2300 year prophecy was the year 457 B.C., before Christ. How do we know that? Okay, we don't have time to go into all the detail now, but suffice it to say that the 2300-day prophecy has the same starting point as the 70-week prophecy, also called the 490-year prophecy. And they both start counting when Artaxerxes, king of Persia, issued the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There are several decrees given by King Cyrus, for example. He was the one who started with the decrees. He, King Cyrus first gave a decree that they uh, should go back and start building up the temple again, rebuilding the temple. But this was the third decree and last decree on the matter of the temple and, and the city of Jerusalem. And Artaxerxes, king of Persia, issued the decree to restore and rebuild the temple, but also restore and rebuild Jerusalem as a city with a governing council, and not just the temple, it was also the city of Jerusalem and the state of Israel. So this is all described in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, if you want to go back and read that. So if we count 2,300 years starting in 457 B.C., we land in 1844. Now, there's a common mistake uh, that people think it ends in 1843, but there is no zero year. You know, when you go from B.C. to A.D., there's no zero year. You go from minus, you go from B.C. to 1 A.D., so there's no zero year, and that's why there's sometimes a little bit of confusion, but you actually land in the year 1844. So this means that by the year 1844, the sanctuary was going to be restored and cleansed. Let's now take a moment to explain what this means. So the restoration, so the cleansing of the sanctuary was something that was a process that start. We already studied this, right? Remember, the cleansing of the sanctuary starts on October 22nd, 1844, when Jesus leaves the holy place of the sanctuary to enter the most holy place of the sanctuary to perform a work of judgment on God's people, right? That's the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. For the restoration of the sanctuary, the truths that we're going to uh, be studying now in part two, the truths began to be restored through the process of the Protestant Reformation a number of truths were already being restored, but thanks to a movement that really um, was founded, if you will, for lack of a better word, was catalyzed, is more like it was triggered, is probably even a better word, um, in 1844, a, a movement of many Protestant denominations coming together. This is the um, the culminating uh, piece of the restoration because this group is going to restore truth that heretofore had been neglected, right, or, or misunderstood. So 1844, something very critical happens in the same way that it happens for the cleansing of the sanctuary, something very critical happens also for the restoration of truth.
in the sanctuary. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. Okay, so what we're going to do now is take a quick tour of the sanctuary. And we're going to associate to each article of furniture in each section of the sanctuary the corresponding desecration performed by the Antichrist. So we're going to study how the Antichrist desecrated God's truth. Now, we already saw that a little bit in part one. uh, But now what I want to do is I want to pin it, I want to map it to specific sections and articles of furniture in the sanctuary so that when, brothers and sisters, I just want you to understand that when the Bible says he cast down truth to the ground, he cast down the sanctuary to the ground, I want you to see how it means, um, how it's so literal, right? The Bible is very, there's a level of Bible uh, reading, which is a very literal one. God says it, he means it, right? So there can be all kinds of symbolic interpretations, but on some level, it's going to be very literal. So that's what I want us to to look at here. Okay, let's start with the desecration of the outer court. The desecration of the outer court of the sanctuary. The altar of sacrifice. We saw it. Jesus' perfect sacrifice is negated by the Antichrist power. The papacy pushed the purchase of indulgences and other works as the means to salvation. Altar of sacrifice cast down. The laver. The cleansing that is represented by baptism was replaced by counterfeits. Infant baptism. Baptism by sprinkling. No, no, no. The papacy um, did not acknowledge the basic Bible teaching about baptism, which is you must repent You must confess your sins and you must make a public declaration before the assembly of the saints that you are now going to die with Christ. You're going to die to sin and you're going to be reborn in Christ as a new creation. That is the deep meaning of baptism. So the papacy again negated the meaning of baptism by introducing Baptism by sprinkling, infant baptism. You don't know what you're being baptized to if you're an infant. So the papacy took away that requirement to repent and confess our sins and make public confession of our new faith, of our new, uh, the acceptance of our new Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, that we are being born again. All that negated, cast to the ground. Labor, cast to the ground. The desecration of the holy place. Let's start with the table of showbread. The table of showbread represents God's truth, God's word. The papacy burned Bibles and burned at the stake those who owned those Bibles. It refused to acknowledge the authority of scripture in the life of men and in the life of the church. It replaced the truth of God's word with the man-made traditions of the church. In fact, the papacy taught that the Bible was not to be read by people uh, alone, that the Bible needed interpretation by the priests and the bishops and the everybody else, the cardinals, but a child of God was not competent enough to read God's word and be able to understand what it meant. So it was shrouded in secrecy and shrouded in mystery when in fact the God of the, the word of God is plain. It's plain. The word of God speaks plain language. And yes, there's symbolism. And yes, there's a lot that requires a little bit more study. But really, anybody can pick up a Bible and start reading and still get a lot of uh, precious truth and a lot of joy and a a lot of uh, a strong connection with the Lord by reading his word. But the papacy, cast it to the ground. Table of showbread, cast to the ground. The other reason why the table of showbread was cast to the ground was also because, as we saw earlier, these, the, uh, the way that the Catholic Church performs the Holy Communion, it was casting down that Holy Communion, that breaking of bread as Jesus performed it with his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That was cast to the ground. What the papacy is doing is killing Jesus Christ afresh. Every time a mass is pronounced, every time a mass is held, Jesus Christ is crucified afresh. His blood and his flesh are recreated, so-called recreated by the Pope. The blasphemy of the, the highest order cast to the ground. Table of showbread cast to the ground. Now let's look at the seven branch candlestick. 
The seven-branch candlestick cast to the ground. The seven-branch candlestick represents the Holy Spirit. It represents our witnessing for God. It represents the fire of God. It also, by the way, also does represent the Word of God. Because remember, the Bible says, Your Word is a lamp. The Bible says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. So the Word of God is also in the seven-branch candlestick. The candlestick represents, again, the Holy Spirit and the witnessing for God. And remember, the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God, right? The, the Word of God is an inspired Word. It was spoken by the Spirit to holy men who were moved by the Spirit of God. So the papacy does not acknowledge, obviously, as we just said, the Word of God. It does not acknowledge the Holy Spirit as Christ's representative on earth. Remember, Jesus said, I send you my spirit. I will go so that I may send you my comforter. So if I, if I don't go, he won't come. But I go so that I may send you my comforter or the comforter. And uh, the papacy does not acknowledge the Holy Spirit as Christ's representative on earth. Instead, the Pope claims to be vicarious fili dei or the vicar of the Son of God. So here the Pope is putting himself in the place of God, cast to the ground. What else is cast to the ground? The altar of incense. What does the altar of incense represent? The altar of incense represents the mediation of Christ before the Father. Let's read in 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. As we said earlier, the Roman Catholic Church introduced an army of counterfeit intercessors, the Virgin Mary, the saints, the martyrs, the angels, the priests, who simply do not have the mission or the anointing of heaven that Jesus Christ, our high priest, has to mediate for us before the Father. Nobody else has the anointing that Christ has, Christ the Anointed One, to mediate between God and men, to be the bridge between heaven and earth. That is Christ and Christ alone. And when the papacy introduces an army, a host of all manner of counterfeit intercessors, it is casting the altar of incense to the ground. There is another way in which the altar of incense is cast to the ground by the Catholic Church, and that is in the institution of the confessional, in the practice of the confessional. So again, we are to come to Christ alone in a moment of uh, repentance and confession. We pour out our heart to the Lord. We uh, present our sins before him. We know that he already has seen them, but we come with a repentant spirit. We say, Lord, we confess our sins. And the Bible says that he is just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So what is happening here is that there is a man, again, sitting in the place of God, a priest sitting in the place where God should sit, where Jesus should sit. And this man is listening to the confession of other human beings and pretending that he has the power and the authority to absolve of sin, to, to forgive sin. He does not have that authority. That authority belongs to Jesus Christ alone. And that is uh, clearly stated in Mark 2.7. God alone can forgive sins. Mark 2 verse 7. The desecration of the most holy place. The desecration of the most holy place. Okay, the ark now is cast to the ground. The ark cast to the ground. Papacy has transgressed the law of God by changing the law of God, by inducing others to break God's holy law, which is the Ten Commandments. They have omitted the Second Commandment, which prohibits idolatry and image worship. So we already studied that. Changed the holy day of worship from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. So this is how the ark, which contains the Ten Commandments of God's holy law, the ark is cast to the ground. But remember that on top of the ark is the mercy seat, right? So there's one article of furniture in the most holy place, and that is the ark. And on top of the ark is the mercy seat. And this is God's throne where he sits. God sits sovereign over the entire universe. The papacy has tried to come against God's throne 
by claiming that the Pope is the head of the church. As we already studied this in part one, I'm just recapping here, but to show you how the mercy seat was cast to the ground. So by claiming that the Pope is the head of the church in replacement of Christ, the mercy seat is cast to the ground. And this is the ultimate characteristic of the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Truth Restored The light of the Bible was the main catalyst of the Protestant Reformation. Very early in the Christian era, Jerome had translated the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts into Latin, and this is what is called the Latin Vulgate. So this is a very early translation from the Greek and the Hebrew. But remember from what you know about history, right? Only the very privileged, the rulers and the Catholic clergy could read Latin, right? The people had not been instructed in Latin. So what really sparked the spiritual flame that set Europe on fire with the Protestant Reformation was the translations of the Latin Vulgate Bible into the language of the people. So we said in part one, we're just reviewing here quickly, the Waldensian movement that started in the south of France towards the end of the 12th century translated the Bible into the Romance language. So that was the Bible they had. They had translated it into the Romance language. And as you know, the Romance language is the foundation of a lot of the Latin languages like uh, French, Italian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. These are all called Romance languages. Then this uh, Romance language Bible was followed by John Wycliffe's translation into English and then by Martin Luther into German. So from the 1300s through the 1500s, actually 1600s for Martin Luther and uh, the German Bible, for a period of roughly 300 years, these native language translations of the Bible are just pouring fuel into that flame of that Protestant Reformation. And the light that was shed by God's Word brought an entire continent out of the darkness of superstition and the, the slavery to the popes and the clergy and the whims of the pope and the whims of the monks and the friars and the clergy. And all of that was swept away by the powerful rising of the Protestant Reformation. The people could now read God's word by themselves without the need of an interpreter or a translator. And you see, what happened was that the Protestant Reformation gained strength. And uh, why? Because God's people grew in knowledge and they grew in understanding of the scriptures. And God's truth, which had been cast to the ground, began to emerge slowly but surely. Each of the successive Protestant denominations, and let me just make one point here very quickly, because of the power of the Protestant Reformation, the church had to react, as we said earlier. That's why in the 1600s, the Jesuits came on the scene with the mission to stomp out the Protestant Reformation. That was their mission. That was what or originally gave them uh, their reason for being. But that was the power of the Reformation, that it, the, the church had to react. The church had to put in place a counter-reformation in order to deal with what was happening, with the mess that it had on its hands, right? With all the reformers coming up with great power, the power that's in the Word of God. Now, having said that, what I want us to focus on now is the beauty of how the successive Protestant denominations that came on the scene vindicated one or more aspects of God's truth. And we're going to map that in the same way that we mapped the casting down. We mapped that to the different sections and, and articles of furniture of the sanctuary. Now we're going to do the same thing. It is beautiful. It is so beautiful. We're going to map the restoration of truth as light penetrated the heavenly sanctuary, as the sanctuary truths were restored, greater and greater light was shining. And it is a beautiful unfolding to see how the successive denominations, God 
uh, entrusted to each one a, a, an aspect of truth that needed to be restored. I love this study. Let's start, as we started before, uh, with the casting down. Let's start with the restoration of the outer court. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. The restoration of the outer court. The altar of sacrifice is restored. Hallelujah. The Lutherans reinstated Jesus' perfect sacrifice as the only means of salvation. Salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Salvation cannot be gained by works, but only by faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation cannot be purchased. It can only be gained by faith in Jesus Christ. This is the Protestant doctrine of righteousness by faith. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord that the Lutherans reinstated this beautiful truth. The restoration of the laver. The Baptists reinstated baptism by immersion. And they reinstated baptism as the key way, the only way, to make public confession of our faith and die to sin and die to self and be reborn with Jesus as a new creation. Praise the Lord. The restoration of the holy place. The table of showbread is restored. Hallelujah. The table of showbread represents God's word. Brave men stood up against the papacy to translate the Bible into the language of the people. Millions of Protestants died at the stake defending your right and my right to own a Bible, to read it for ourselves, to not need anyone else to interpret it, so that we may live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, I don't know if you realize what a precious treasure has been entrusted into our hands, the very word of God. We must not take it for granted. Restoration of the seven branch candlestick. The seven branch candlestick represents the Holy Spirit and our witnessing for God. The Methodist Church restored witnessing as a key aspect of the Christian faith. The Methodist Church proposed a method of giving Bible study. They were disciples of Christ and they knew that there was a way to gain disciples. There was a way to empower people to study the Bible and learn the Bible and study God's word for themselves. And so this is the, the truth that the Methodist Church restored. Hallelujah. They restored the seven branch candlestick. Restoration of the altar of incense. The altar of incense represents prayer and intercession. The Calvinists put a special emphasis on prayer and confession to be reconciled with God. Now, of course, all Protestant denominations accepted and today still accept God's teaching that his son is the only bridge between heaven and earth. Let's read in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those that come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus alone can forgive sins. The Restoration of the Most Holy Place Restoration of the Ark and the Mercy Seat Now let's go back and do just a little bit of history here. Um, so we said that the 2300-day prophecy ended in 1844, right? So in 1844, God started up a movement of so-called Adventists, people of all denominations, Baptists, Calvinists, Lutherans, Methodists, and every other uh, Christian denomination who came together who were believing in the second coming of Christ, and they were they had mistakenly interpreted parts of the prophecy to mean that Jesus was coming back to the earth in 1844. That wasn't the case. The prophecy is, was actually saying that Jesus was moving from the holy place into the most holy place in uh, 1844. So they misunderstood the event. They got the date right, but they misunderstood the event. We've studied this before, so just, I'm just reviewing here. So what happened then in 1844, this movement comes into existence. All of these f faithful believers... Uh, uh, crying out, waiting for the Lord to come and, and, and crying out to their God to, for Jesus to come back. And they were bitterly disappointed, as we had studied, when Jesus did not come back in 1844. 
But then this movement continued. They continued searching scripture. They continued trying to understand and decipher the prophecies. And that led to the creation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, when it in, at, its, at its inception, was not a denomination. It was a movement. It was a cross-denominational movement. It subsequently lost a little bit of its fire, sadly, and it became a denomination. But truly, its origin was a cross-denominational movement of people who were believing in the second coming of Jesus, people who were eagerly waiting and expectantly uh, awaiting the return of the Messiah. And this impetus that they had led them to study and restore other truths that had not yet been restored by the preceding Protestant denominations. So what truths does the Seventh-day Adventist church or movement restore? Okay, so we're talking about the most holy place where we have the ark and we have the mercy seat. So the ark, we said, represents the law of God. The Seventh-day Adventist church restored the times and laws that the papacy intended to change. So first, Adventists restored the importance of God's law as such, the importance of the law in the Christian walk. So the law of God, the Ten Commandments, have not been nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments are still in force. And the Adventists restored, therefore, the Second and the Fourth Commandments. And interestingly enough, both commandments relate to proper worship. And we know that in the end time, the issue at the end of time, the issue over the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. The end time issue is over worship. Who will you worship, the beast or God? So the Adventists who came late onto the scene of the Protestant Reformation, the Adventist restored the importance of the second law, uh, you're not to worship idols or images, and the fourth commandment, the fourth law, which is keep the Sabbath holy, not the first day of the week, but the seventh day of the week. Also, the Seventh-day Adventists restored historicism as the correct method of Bible interpretation. So as a result of the Jesuit Counter-Reformation, we had lost sight the, the Protestant world had lost sight of what was the proper interpretation, the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has restored historicism as the proper method of Bible interpretation. Now, secondly, right, in the terms of restoring the mercy seat, the Seventh-day Adventist Church also restored the prophetic understanding of the identity of the Antichrist. By restoring the method, we restored the answer. By using the right method, by knowing what is the right method to interpret Bible prophecy, we get to the right answer of who the Antichrist is. This knowledge had been lost, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church, starting roughly around the year 1844, started to restore this truth. And this Seventh-day Adventist movement has a duty, a responsibility, a sacred responsibility to educate the Protestant world, the evangelicals in particular, but the entire Protestant world about the proper interpretation of Bible prophecy. Now, by restoring the method, the Seventh-day Adventist church is able to clearly identify the Antichrist power and, and, and say who, what is the identity of the Antichrist power. The Antichrist power, without a doubt, is the papacy by doing so, by denouncing the Antichrist power. SDA, Seventh-day Adventist or SDAs, have restored the mercy seat as the throne of the true God. The Pope has tried and continues to try to usurp the place of God, the seat of God, the throne of God. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church is saying, sorry, you are not God. You do not sit in the place of God. 
You do not show yourself in the temple, showing yourself that you are God and sitting in the place of God. No, the mercy seat belongs to the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. The ultimate choice. Think of this process of the Protestant restoration of truth as a relay race. Brothers and sisters were hungry for truth after centuries of lies and deceptions. They were looking to obey God and not the vain traditions of men. The Waldensians, the Lutherans, the Baptists, and the Methodists, among other denominations, all carried the baton forward to each successive team until the baton is brought to the finish line. Seventh-day Adventists are charged with finishing the work. Seventh-day Adventists are not better than anyone else. They were simply raised up for such a time as this. SDAs are a prophetic movement that was made up of pioneers of all denominations. To SDAs, to Seventh-day Adventists, has been entrusted the saving truth for the last generation, the generation that will face the most trying time ever since there was a nation Matthew 24. There's no pride in what I'm saying about Seventh-day Adventism. On the contrary, it's very sobering. To whom much is given of him, much is required, right? So the final judgment will be so much more stringent on Seventh-day Adventists for all the light that we've received. And I'm trying to share that light with you today. But ultimately, the choice of whether you receive that light or not is yours. So all I'm saying is, to them has been entrusted a truth for the end time. That doesn't mean that it's a higher truth. doesn't mean that it's a better truth. It just means that in the successive chain of truths that needed to be restored, these truths that have been entrusted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church are simply the ones for our time. Again, I'm not invalidating the truths that came before. We would not be who we are if we had not had all that succession of restoration of truth. But here we are in the end time. And this movement has been charged with this message to let the world know, who, the world who has forgotten, let the world know, remind the world of the identity of the Antichrist. Bring this message to the world about what's coming, the fake or counterfeit unity under Rome, the mark of the beast, the last seven plagues, the need to come out of Babylon and embrace truth, the need to unite under God's truth. That is the message that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been entrusted with. We open in part one with God's choice that he put before the children of Israel. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Let me close with this. It's no accident that 2017 was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. No accident. In the Bible, remember, God knows the end from the beginning. And he knew when that 500th anniversary would fall. In the Bible, the number five has several meanings or symbolisms that I believe are particularly relevant for us today. So the 500th anniversary is not by accident, not by chance, not by coincidence. But the number five has meaning. Let us understand what are the meanings associated with the number five. The number five represents grace, it represents intercession, and it represents God's goodness. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. The tabernacle, now why do I say that? The tabernacle that Moses built up in the wilderness for the Lord was a mini model of the plan of salvation. We already studied this, but interesting fact, the tabernacle was built mostly on five by five measurements. The tabernacle had five priests, Aaron and his four sons, who ministered to God in that tabernacle and interceded on behalf of the people. 
So I believe that God is saying something about the restoration of the tabernacle, the restoration of the sanctuary in this 500th anniversary, brothers and sisters. The truth of the sanctuary needs to be restored. All of it. All of it. Now, what else is associated with the grace and the goodness of God and the intercession before God? Well, Abraham pleaded with God on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, he started by asking God whether, remember when he was testing God's grace and he said, uh, Lord, if you find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? If you find 45 righteous, will you spare the city? If you find 40 righteous, will you spare the city? So Abraham was pleading with God, interceding and subtracting by five on his intercession. The goodness of God is shown by uh, Jesus feeding the multitude of 5,000 with five loaves of barley. And finally, God holds us in the palm of his hand as a manifestation of his goodness and his grace. He literally holds us in the palm of his hand, which, by the way, has five fingers. And God reassures us that nothing can snatch us out of his hand. The number five also represents righteousness or right doing. Five is the number of the fingers on each of our hands because we were made in the image and the likeness of God and the hand represents doing. So this is why I believe that the number five also represents righteousness or right doing. Righteousness is right doing. God, what else uh, leads me to say this? God gave the children of Israel the Torah or the Pentateuch, the five books of the law. And in those five books, the children of Israel had everything they needed to live in right standing before God. Messiah had not been born yet, but everything that they were doing revolved around the sanctuary. All the feasts, all the offerings, all the sacrifices, the intercession, it all revolved around the sanctuary. And it was all described and all codified in those five books of the Torah. And then, in terms of righteousness and right doing, God gave the children of Israel five types of sacrifice that they needed to offer on a regular basis as part of the sanctuary system in order to walk with him. The burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering. Finally, the number five represents preparedness. It represents preparedness, being prepared to defeat the enemy of our souls. So David gathered five stones to fight Goliath, and he won, by the way. David gathered five stones. Jesus quoted the fifth book of the Torah, which is the book of Deuteronomy, to defeat Satan in the wilderness. And Jesus overcame by quoting the fifth book. Now, God's anointing oil in the tabernacle was based on a formula made with five ingredients. This is very interesting. Five ingredients in the anointing oil used in the tabernacle. And we know that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And this leads us to the last five, the five unwise virgins or the five foolish virgins versus the five wise virgins who had oil in their lamps, meaning that they had the Spirit of God in their lamps. And the five wise virgins were prepared to meet the bridegroom. The Lord is telling us today, I believe, again, no accident, all these fives. The Lord is telling us today that all the truths of the sanctuary need to be restored. We are in danger, brothers and sisters. We are in danger of forgetting as a Protestant movement, as Protestants, as members of Protestant denominations, all of us run the dangers of being drunk with the wine of Babylon. We run the danger of forgetting who we are. We run the danger of having amnesia, collective amnesia, and forgetting who we are as a denomination and who we are as a Protestant people. Forgetting the truths that people have died for. Forgetting the truths that have been uh, restored at such high cost. We are in danger of losing everything that we have acquired. We are in danger 
of the leaders of the Protestant denominations, the false prophet of the evil trilogy. Remember the evil trilogy in the book of Revelation, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We identified the dragon, Satan. We identified the beast. It's the papacy. And who is the false prophet? The false prophet is apostate Protestantism who were working. We're going to say a lot more about this in our next study. That's what our next study is devoted to is precisely this, the study of the, the false prophet. But we run the risk of these apostate leaders just completely renouncing truth, compromising truth, and shaking hands with the beast power, shaking hands with the Antichrist power, and coming together in an unholy alliance with the papacy that will lead, as we said earlier, to the taking of the mark of the beast, worshiping on Sunday and taking the mark of the beast. So I believe that the Lord is telling us today that the time of grace is running out. We need to get it together. We have got to get it together. And the question is, will Jesus find a people willing to stand in the gap for apostate religions, apostate nations, apostate denominations? Will he find a people willing to stand in the gap, to intercede, to plead for those people? Will Jesus find a people obedient to his law and living by his word? Will he find a people prepared to stand in the time of trouble that's about to be unleashed on the whole world? Will Jesus find a people that will be willing to give up their lives if required, but not compromise the truth of the word of God, not compromise God's Ten Commandments? Will Jesus find faith on the earth? Will Jesus still find faith on the earth when he comes? Where do you stand? Where do you stand? May the Lord give us His grace, His righteousness, and His Spirit that we may answer even so. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us this precious light, this precious unveiling of truth to open our eyes. I pray that the scales would fall off of our eyes. I pray that there would be no more blindness, no more Laodicean blindness, but that you would give us eyes of to see the truth about our spiritual condition, but also to behold great things in your law and in your holy word. Father, I ask for each and every one of us the anointing of your spirit, that we may be prepared to stand though the heavens fall, that we may not be caught without oil in our lamps, but that each and every one of us will burn brightly with the word of God, bright witnesses, flames of fire as fell upon the disciples at Pentecost, that we would be covered in the glory of God, beholding you, Father, that we may become transformed and changed from glory to glory, and that others would look upon us and see the glory of Christ reflected in us, not our own glory, but your glory. Father, I ask that every person who has listened to this study, who has taken these truths to heart, I pray that you would protect them, Lord, from taking the mark of the beast, that each and every one of them, Father, would, would rather die than sin against you, and that all of us together will be standing, will be able to stand until the very end to greet and meet our Lord Jesus in the air. Father, I thank you. I give you honor and glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you for listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any question related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com. To find out more, 
visit our website at citybiblegroup.com. Hi, I'm Marla Ilana. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with me. Please click on the subscribe button below and you'll be blessed with many more powerful truths for our generation. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready?